<laughs> it is that good. Sorry, I hate doing that Top Gear thing. Look at me, I'm having a good time. But that's just what this car makes you do. So I'm here reviewing what I consider to be the best car on sale today. And it's this Toyota. Honestly, I don't think there's a better car pound for pound on sale today than the Toyota Yaris. Well, this particular Yaris. Yeah, this particular Yaris. What a thing. I mean, it's not even a Yaris, to be honest. It says Yaris on the back, but it also, importantly, says grrr. Grrr. Which I think must stand for the noise it makes. Grrr. Obviously not, of course. It actually stands for Gazoo Racing, that being Toyota's fast department. Now, usually when racing divisions and hatchbacks come together, you get some badges, some big wheels, and occasionally some meaningful chassis and power upgrades. But this thing goes way beyond that because this is a homologation special. Uh-huh. Yeah, homologation, what a word. It's basically the idea that a car company has to produce a certain number of road legal versions of a competing race car, which makes for a level playing field. It stops the bigger companies from spending limitless cash on making one-off race cars. Kind of like how in football, financial fair play rules stop teams like Paris Saint-Germain dominating the entire- Messi again, this time maybe Messi's done it! There's the goal! Oh. Anyways. <laughs> Toyota wanted to compete in the World Rally Championship with the Yaris, but the standard Yaris is about as suited to rallying as a sumo suit is to professional boxing. And so Toyota's boss, this guy, was like, you know what, let's do a proper rally car that we can sell to real customers as a treat for them. Here is the result, and honestly, what a thing. So for a start, it's three door only, unlike the standard Yaris, which is five door only. Heck, it's not even on the same chassis. Well, the front end is, but the back end is from that celebrated race car, the Corolla. Anyway, it's a good thing because it facilitates a wider track. The roof is significantly lower and it's made of actual carbon fiber, which lowers the weight and the center of gravity of the car in general. How many small hatchbacks have a carbon fiber roof? Not many. And the doors and the tailgate and the bonnet are all made of aluminium. And under the bonnet is the world's most powerful production three cylinder engine. 261 horsepower and all developed inside three chambers, each about the size of a can of monster. Now they're all being force fed by a big turbo to make that happen. And genuinely, I reckon it is the best sounding small capacity engine I've ever heard. It's all induction hiss and turbo whistle. Listen. Even at low loads, so when you're just going around the streets, you can hear the dump valve, listen. Do you hear that? All of that stuff is an accompaniment to that classic three-cylinder, well, grrr. Grrr. Honestly, it is absolutely sensational, this thing. It's like low-speed corners like this, you just power into it, and the car just does its thing. It's almost like you don't really have to think about it. You just plug into it, and it does exactly what you feel that you want it to do. And look at man, the wheel arches are so wide that you can sit on them comfortably. Ish. In fact, the only bits that this shares with your mum's Yaris are the light clusters, the wing mirrors, and this fin here. But while how it looks and how it sounds are definitely alluring qualities, they are far from the best things about the GR Yaris. Lots of small cars are loud and fast and look cool. Nope, the best thing about this is the way it makes you feel when you turn the wheel. You see, the homologation thing goes far beyond a few lighter bits and a big turbo. Now, it is a stretch to call this no compromise, right? It still has back seats and a radio and a boot, but Unlike all other hatchbacks, or most of the hatchbacks anyway, this is a driver's car first and a shopper's car second. So if you're still thinking that this is just a three-door Yaris, here's me trying to sit in the back. And the boot is more than 100 litres smaller because they've had to fit a battery under here and 
there's a four-wheel drive system happening as well. And it's that, the four-wheel drive system, that really elevates this thing way over your bog-standard overcooked hatchback. The most predominant and demonstrable characteristic of this car is just how quickly it's capable of covering ground when it's not going in a straight line. Any car can be fast really, but it's very difficult to get a car to feel this fast going around a corner. It just grips harder and truer than most other cars that you care to name. But it does so in such a predictable way that it positively encourages you to find out where its limits are. Thankfully, its limits are almost certainly way beyond yours, mine you will just find yourself barreling through B-road corners in this much quicker than you thought possible. Within the confines of the law, obviously. And yet, you will not feel in any way like you're always on the edge of something catastrophic happening. And that's not something you can say about this thing. Not at all. Terrifying this thing. Amazing, yeah? But terrifying all the same at times. Yes, the Porsche 911 GT3. Now, if the Yaris is a future classic, and it is for reasons that we'll come to, then this is a bona fide today classic. So this version called the 992 is the fourth 911 based GT3. The GT3 badge denoting a 911 that's almost entirely focused on giving you the very purest driving experience. Not the fastest one, 911 turbos exist, but the one that, if you know, you know. It too is derived from actual motorsport activity. The GT3 is a racing series for competition built 911s. And seriously, this is about as close to a race car with number plates as you are ever going to get. And this particular one takes more from the race cars than ever before. It's also the most powerful one ever, with 510 horsepower from a four litre, six cylinder engine that hasn't got any turbos on it. And that fact tells you exactly what sort of character you're gonna get out of this. An astronomically loud, characterful, and high revving one. You don't even get all this engine's torque until above 6,000 RPM. Yeah, it makes you work this thing. But before we get into all that properly, let's just take a moment to behold this thing. Now you're probably expecting this to be a bit lighter than your boss's 911, right? And it obviously is, but it's the obsessive approach that Porsche's taken to getting rid of the weight here while still making it a manageable day-to-day -day car that's so deeply impressive about it. And that's before you even get to the aerodynamic stuff that's designed to keep this car pressed down into the ground. So the bonnet here is carbon fiber, as is the roof, as are the front seats. And the rear seats are, actually it doesn't have any of those. They're a waste of time in a 911 at the best of time. So they've just been binned off here. Porsche's even found four and a half pounds worth of sound deadening that it didn't think it needed. So it's just binned that too. Honestly, this thing is more committed to weight loss than 1982 Sylvester Stallone. And you would expect it to have a massive rear wing, yeah? But not this majestic adjustable swan neck spoiler, which generates 150% more downforce than the outgoing GT3 spoiler did. And that is a key component of keeping the back end stable and pressed down at high speed. The air that comes across the front of the car is highly manipulated too. Firstly by this adjustable front splitter, and then because of the way the underbody is shaped. See what Porsche has done is thought long and hard about every aspect of this car so that even though it's got air conditioning and Apple CarPlay and stuff, everything still works together to give you the most enhanced aerodynamic experience imaginable. Now there are, of course, some comfort and refinement compromises. Most obvious example, the seat that you're sat in. It's a carbon fiber bucket, it's tight, but it's also non-adjustable. Well, you can slide it forwards and backwards, but it sits you more upright than the Queen's breakfast bar. And the damping is two stage adjustable, but those stages are rock hard and rock harder. But still, nothing in this car rocks harder than this engine. It absolutely kicks ass. I'd like to show it to you, but you can't. They don't let you open this part. You might be able to see it a bit if you peer through here. Not really. Yeah, it's a cliche, but this really is going to be one of the last big capacity, big power, 
raw, non-turbo petrol engine cars. But what a way to go, eh? And this is also a cliche ride, but the 911 is still all wrong from a physics point of view. Engine at the rear, driving the rear wheels, it's a fundamental nightmare having all of that weight at the back end of the car. And yet. Yes, and yet. What that gives you is a thing that just hits different. All 911s have this feeling of lightness at the front end, this sense of unencumbered turning. It's a thing that you just don't get anywhere else. The way this car steers is millimeter sharp. It responds to the most minute movement. And so you add the histrionics to that, the noise that you get, you know, you hear every stone pinging up under the body and the jiggle that you get because the wheels are telling you every bit of minutia that's underneath them and it's feeding that up through your hands, through the steering wheel. And you just have a car that is absolutely extraordinary no matter where you put it. And it's also a bit rear endy as well. <laughs> I'm gonna get to that, what this is like when it's not perfectly dry. So like I was saying, it feels amazing even before you've got anywhere near finding out what the engine can do. And that's where this gets a bit foggy. You see the Porsche scares us a bit to be honest. See, this is a car that demands everything you've got, every bit of your attention to make the most of it. You have to be really careful on the throttle when you've got any steering lock on. You have to be really careful with the throttle anyway. It is, again, and I'm full of superlatives today, but it's truly brilliant. The thing is though, it's a car that you just have to be careful with. You have to respect it. It's not a car that is easy to drive on its limits. Now the tires are partly to blame, in fact, probably largely to blame. They are fantastic in the right circumstance. They're Michelin Pilot, oh, <clears throat> oh All right, so quick break here. If you're wondering why there's been some variance in the quality of the in-car footage is because we've had a little issue with the camera mount. It's decided to stop working. So it's back to the old GoPro, there you go. I had the perspicacity to bring a spare camera. Anyway, on with the video. Right, there we go. Take two. You see, this is a car that demands everything you've got to make the most of it. It is truly fantastic, obviously, but it's a car that is pretty hard to drive at its limits. Now, the tires are largely to blame. They are Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s, and they are fantastic in the right circumstances as in when it's really dry. In perfect conditions, they're stickier than Macaulay Culkin's arch nemesis. We're no longer the wet bandits, we're the sticky bandits. But if they're cold or it's a bit damp or you've got any sort of lock on or any combination of those things and you start getting past five, 6,000 RPM, it starts to get a bit hairy. I know that for a fact. <laughs> I also know for a fact that this has got a really good post roundabout traction control system. <laughs> and because the gearing is so long in this, it'll do 80 miles per hour in second gear. It's just really hard to get this thing showing you exactly what it's capable of outside the confines of a track. And that's just not the case with the Yaris here. It's a car that's preposterously fun, no matter where you are and how fast you're going and how you're driving. So before we start hitting the comments, I am not saying that the Yaris is a better car than this. It's obviously not. This is one of the greatest driver's cars in the world, full stop. I'm just saying that it's at its very best in the hands of somebody who's better at driving than most people, including me. And also when it's on a racetrack. And also when it's in a place that you probably haven't got regular access to, a closed circuit. I'm also not saying that it doesn't feel phenomenal most of the time. It feels phenomenal now, doing 28 miles per hour on a street. This always feels like the sort of thing that just generates superlative upon superlative. And another big part of that is because of another dying thing. This thing here, gearbox. Yep, manual gearbox. You see, if you look at the other supercar type things that you might want to spend your 150 odd grand on, you'll notice that they all come as standard with automatic flappy paddle gearboxes. Now you can have one of those with a GT3 if you want, but you can also have it with a six speed manual, which gives the car an old school type of purity that you will just enjoy all the time. Because it's one of the best manual gearboxes you will ever throw. It's so short and tight that it almost feels like it's doing the work itself. It's like you're using your hand to just suggest where it should go and it goes there. And actually, most of the time, it's that sort of thing. It's the mechanical heft of this car that will make you feel good more of the time 
than when you've got it up at its 9,000 RPM limit, which probably won't happen very often at all. Doing that is obviously outstandingly glorious, but it's the other things, and they're both significant and seemingly insignificant. It's the preternatural heft of the steering, and that's something you'll enjoy most of the time. It's the sound that the gearbox makes when you change that clack, that mechanical thing. It's the heft of the brake pedal. They really make you work these pedals. You would have to give them a good shove to get the car to stop. When you do hit them hard, they stop the thing quicker than Quentin Tarantino stops a bad interview. And I'm shutting you down. What I'm saying is that you just know that you're in a race car here. It's just one that's been made as normal as possible for you. The Toyota, on the other hand, feels like a normal car that turns you into a racer. Again, within the confines of the law. And that is a very real difference and one that makes you feel better at the job of being a driver for much more of the time. So this too has a gearbox with loads of mechanical integrity. It also has the same throttle blipping thing on downshifts if you put it into that mode, like the Porsche does. Automatic heel and toe. You can look that up if you want to. And this also has a steering rack with nuance and feel. Not as much as the Porsche, obviously, but more than enough. It's an M sort of corner as well. This is so good, those low speed ones where you can almost steer on the throttle. If you've got it in sport mode, you put your foot down a bit and the diff does its thing, the back end starts to go out a bit, but it's always so tractable on the throttle. That's what makes this feel like so much fun. It's very rare that you can get a car going sideways like this in such a predictable way. It even has details like it sits you high, right? Now it's a bit annoying at first because as you can see, I haven't really got much headroom here. But the reason they've done that is because rally drivers like to sit high so they can see apexes properly. And actually, when you're driving on a road like this, it does help. Not that apexes matter on a standard road, but you can just see where you're turning a bit better. And I haven't even talked about the driving modes yet either. Well, I did a bit, but I was kind of making that up as I went along. Sorry, Joe. So predictably, this isn't like a normal hot hatch when it comes to the driving mode thing. It doesn't have a button that just weights up the steering a bit or makes the suspension a bit stiffer. It actually has one damper setting this, and it's really good. Brilliant balance of feel and comfort day to day. It's amazing. You get bounced around a little bit, obviously, but that's the price you pay for having a car that lets you feel exactly what's going on underneath the tires. So what you get is a little dial down here with three modes, normal, sport, and track. And what they do is adjust the way that the four wheel drive system is apportioning torque between the axles. In normal mode, it'll send 60% of the drive to the front axle for stability's sake. In track mode, it's 50-50 for maximum cornering traction. Sport one's the best mode though, fun mode, because what sport mode does is send 70% of the power to the back axle. And what that gives you is this insane ability to get the rear of the car stepping out during a corner on the throttle. Listen to that, that's the throttle flipping itself. Go in the corner. <laughs> it just tidies itself up from the back and off you go, honestly. The amount of grip that this car has, it somehow manages to balance being really loud and mental and a bit back endy, fast obviously, with just having this like sense of being predictable, like giving you total control over what's happening. You could never lean on the Porsche this hard on a road like this because you'd always be worried that something was going to go badly wrong. This, you can spend more of your brain power just enjoying what you're actually doing. The last time I had a drive like this was in an Evo 10. I think I emptied the tank in about 40 minutes. It's on my birthday a few years ago. Oh, look at that man, you, can, you get it slight now, but it doesn't really worry you at all because you know it's just gonna come back into line, no bother. Sorry, I'm leaning on cliche here, car journalism cliche as much as I'm leaning on the tires. Oh, listen to that man, seriously. 30 grand cars, right? shouldn't really be this much fun. So is there anything wrong with this car? Well, actually, yeah, the interior is a bit crap. It's a bit gray and naff. And just to go off script a bit, I would never be able to convince our Nicola to get one of these. We've just got a mini John Cooper works and this is much better to drive than that thing, much better. But actually, for the majority of the time that you're just in the cars day to day, not doing this sort of thing, the Mini is just a much better car. It's got a better drag position, it just feels better quality. It's more fun to look at on the inside. And if there is one thing that this car has going against it, it's that I think that a lot of people will just get in this thing and think, nah. And you can't really get somebody out test driving a car like this, can you? 
if you could get everybody who walked into a Toyota showroom who was mildly interested in one out to a track on one in one of these, then they'd probably sell a lot more of them. Also, the fact is, you are going to buy this as a day-to-day -day car. That's what a hatchback is. So you can live with the little back seats and the little boot and that. But it is quite noisy. It does have some refinement issues. There's loads of flutter comes from the glass at motorway speeds. The tyres are ridiculously noisy. There's even wind flutter comes from the bottom of the screen here, just at like 40, 50. And the ride quality is hard. So it is a car that could potentially get tiresome for you as a runabout, unless you are really invested in how good it is to drive and doing that frequently in it. Going for nice drives, I mean, not just going to work and back. I honestly think that in the real world, in which we all exist, obviously, you put a normal driver in the Porsche and in the Toyota, and the Toyota is the quicker car. And that's what makes it so special and why it's already in my top 10 cars of all time, I reckon. This kind of reminds me of the first time I drove an Impreza Turbo. That characteristic of just being able to fling it into a corner and the car sorts itself out. And it's about a fifth of the price of this thing, assuming you can even get one of these things, which you probably can't. And so that's that. Now, obviously, if I had the money, I'd have this thing. Yeah, everybody would, right? But this whole setup reminds me of a middleweight boxer that's sent into a ring to fight with a heavyweight. And the middleweight dances around the heavyweight, beats the crap out of him for 11 rounds, and then gets knocked out late in the 12th. So it's like an obvious victory for this, but this is the one that everybody comes away remembering or being most impressed by. And we'll end it there. Thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate your time. Hope you enjoyed that. Have a look at our other reviews, if you did. And please let us know in the comments what you think about these two cars and whether you think I'm totally wrong about this whole thing. Now, see you soon. Bye.